only way as we sit here today that you're going to be able to meet the power requirements of the American society. And they'll grow at different rates. And coal might grow at the slowest rate of, of those three. Renewables will probably grow at the fastest rate. But again, it's where we sit today and, and the magnitude of the demand that uh, is just enormous. And the challenges to meet that will be even greater. Part of why we've been blessed in the heartland of America um, with our manufacturing base, and it's part of what we need to do to get this economy restarted, is a focus on low-cost electricity. The reason that we have low-cost electricity principally is because those states have a dominance of coal-fired power. And when you look at some of our coastal states and our higher-cost states where the price of electricity is three or four or sometimes even five times higher, um, than some of our coal fired, particularly at an industrial rate, you can see why it's so important that we continue to use our natural resources and use them wisely. Again, as a cost comparison, if we were firing our, our delivering millions of BTUs uh, out of the Powder River Basin, the, the cheapest coal in the world, um, you know, it's 82 cents per million BTUs, where if we were firing it by oil, it's $15, and you can see the rest of it. Here in CAP, Central Appalachia, West Virginia, it's about $3 per million BTUs. Um, costs are being challenged, costs will go up, but to maintain our rates, to maintain our lifestyles, to, and, and everybody in this room pays power prices, to not have rates go up 20, 30, 40 percent uh, over the next several years, we have to be smart about our regulatory environment, smart about how we use coal, and coal is the principal part of keeping the rates low. You probably can't see the little red dot up there, and this is a Powder River Basin slide, and, and it's, um, you know, those who have never been there, it, it's an incredible place. Uh, the, the mines are big. They're, you know, at our largest mine, we'll mine 120 million to 140 million tons of coal uh, per year. Put that in perspective, um, state of West Virginia will mine a little bit more than that, but not much of that. So um, it's just the good Lord put a lot of coal out there. It's lower quality. It's only thermal coal. But there's 80 billion tons of coal per square mile out there. It's an enormous concentration of energy, and, and it's part of what drives America. And it's, again, part of the reason we can offer such low electricity rates compared to many around the world. Turning to the environment. You know, sometimes I'll get in the audience, I'll get a question, you know, and say, well, there's no such thing as clean coal. And I will argue that there's such thing as cleaner coal. And we can all, always argue how many nines do we take out a, a study of whatever we want to look at. But nonetheless, we have used more and more coal in America. And if you go back to 1970, the population has grown by 50 percent. We've increased our coal-based electricity by 150 percent, and our GDP has grown by 200 percent. Yet admissions, as measured by the Clean Air Act, by EPA, have gone down approximately 70 percent of what they were in 1970. And that is the applica application of clean coal technology. It's not a silver bullet. It's a step at a time. It's, you know, scrubbers, it's catalytic converters, it's low NOx burners, it's a whole host of things. And each step has made an improvement. That continues today. The challenge, of course, and I don't know where you fall on the CO2 spectrum, but the challenge, of course, is CO2. And coal does emit more CO2 than natural gas. Um, but nonetheless, uh, when you look at the world and what's going on in the world, you know, the U.S. CO2 emissions have actually kind of flatlined somewhere around five to six gigatons. And a gigaton's a lot. Don't let that. But nonetheless, we've kind of been able to stabilize our output. We haven't brought it down. And it's unlikely we're going to be able to in the, in the near term. Then you look at what's going on in China. You go back to that map where I showed you the just focusing on coal plants being built around the world are the cars that were being um, projected to be driven around the world. And you start thinking about, if we're serious about trying to stabilize CO2 in the atmosphere, and if we want to make that commitment as a society, I mean, we could eliminate CO2 in the United States, and it doesn't change the outcomes of the models. 
you have to be able to address it in the developing world and the OC, you know, 80% of the world is a non-OECD, the developing world. Uh, they're emitting more CO2 today in total than, than the U.S. or Europe, but we have to develop carbon capture and sequestration. And the president actually gets that. You wouldn't always know it from his speeches, but I have talked to him about it. So does Steve Chu, the Secretary of Energy. And those are the challenges that really to resolve the problem, taking an engineering approach as to, say, a political approach. The question is, do we want to make those investments? And it will raise the cost. And we do have to substantiate the, the quality and the ability of the technologies. But things are going on in that arena. And we have captured, and we capture CO2 today. I mean, uh, right now it's being injected into old oil fields and allows them to recover more oil. Um, being driven by the price of oil, frankly, but nonetheless, those technologies have do exist, and it's going on, and actually has been going on for about 30 years. Coal can now also be converted into transportation fuels. When you look at, um, we have a project that we'll talk about in a moment, where we're, the goal is to take coal, convert it into gasoline, capture roughly half of the CO2, and sell it into the oil fields. And the actual petroleum gasoline that comes out of there, I should say the coal gasoline, is cleaner and cleaner burning and has less emissions than refined petroleum gasoline. But, you know, is it absolutely zero CO2? Absolutely not. Um, as we decarbonize the automotive fleets with plug-ins, the electricity has to be produced somewhere, and we've seen the charts, and, and all of the fuels will be part of that uh, total electric grid. You know, what's ARCH doing and some of the clean coal technology, we talked a little bit about health and safety. Uh, we've also have other activities at other universities in, in the health and safety arena. But also we've, we've really dedicated our spending about $50 million on clean coal technologies with both the universities, uh, smaller independent com companies that have their own research going on, uh, actual uh, trailblazers and actual uh, utility that's trying to build a plant to capture all of their CO2 and DKRW was the coal to gasoline plant I was talking about. So with that, I'll really close my remarks, but you know, for the men and young men and women in the room, the students thinking about your careers, again in my opening comments, you know, when I was coming out of graduate school and looking at it, I was born in South Dakota, but I grew up in California. I'd never seen a lump of coal. And I had a friend call me, and, and he said, you know, why don't you look at the energy business? It's the biggest business in the world, and probably always will be. And I would argue that's probably still a, a true statement. The opportunities for a young man or a young woman today are better than what they were for when I was coming out of school. We have a lot of the same environment. The, the economy looked terrible. Carter was president. Carter was not a good president. He was not a strong leader. Uh, things were going south on the global economy. We had massive inflation just starting to kick off. But what I did is I looked at the coal industry and, and people were saying that it was dead. That you know no one had gone into it for the 50s and the 60s, which was a true statement. But energy prices were rising, the world needs for energy were growing. And I looked at it and I said, you know, there's not any 20-year-olds, there's no 30-year-olds, there's no 40-year-olds in this industry. There's a bunch of 50-year-olds, some 60-year-olds, but really there were no young people. And I remember t talking to my mom and I said, you know, I'm going to take this offer I had and uh, go see what it's all about because since they don't have any bench, they're going to have to give you a time at bat because there's literally no one else to, to do anything. So you got to do as much and work as hard as you could, and you got your time at bat. You might strike out, you might get a base hit, you might get a home run. And frankly, it worked out okay. I mean, I, I was pretty happy as I look back at, and, and from a career standpoint. But evaluate your careers on your needs and your interests. Do something you like. Do something you love if you can. Keep your ethics. Keep your integrity never do anything that would take those away from you. And if someone asks you to do it, walk away. And I can assure you in your career, you will be presented with that opportunity. I've seen it. When I was a salesman in Europe, you know, people asked for things that were inappropriate to ask for. I walked away from it. Maybe someone else didn't, but that's, you got to answer to yourself and look in the mirror every day. So 
it's a great, great opportunity in the energy sector. We've got challenges here uh, for the next few years in our, our economy, but nonetheless, for the best, the brightest, the hardest working, the, the, the men and women who really want to go after it, there will be more opportunities in the coming decade than there have been, I think, in the last two or three decades. So with that, be happy to open it to any questions or we can go have a, a quick glass of water and a cookie or something. So. Yes. What kind of responsibilities come as chairman and chief executive officer? Um, the question was, what kind of responsibilities come with chairman and chief executive officer? Different than you would think. Um, you know, when you are the president or in charge of operations, you frankly get to do things you like. You get to go see customers. You get to go see the mines, the operations, um, the things you might normally associate with the CEO or the chairman. Once you move to the chairmanship, you spend a lot of your time in dealing with the regulatory and the political bodies of Washington, which frankly are not my favorite places to spend time, but it demands an enormous amount of your time. You spend a lot of time on Wall Street because you're looking at uh, the capital needs and the financing of the corporation, which isn't so bad, but nonetheless, it's, it's not nearly as much fun as going to one of the coal mines or, or going to see one of the customers. I'd much rather do that than, than Wall Street. Um, and then, deference to Tom and the board, you spend a lot of time with your board because um, you know, they're the, the senior management group of, of the corporation, if you want, and, and they're, they're helping set strategy with the CEO. Uh, they're there to really make sure that the integrity, the goals, uh, the the uh, reputation of the corporation continues to go in the right direction. And I can assure you as a CEO, you want a board who is active, is not passive, who will tell you what they think. Sometimes you don't like to hear what they tell you, but uh, they, they're very direct and very open. And, and my board sometimes is way too much on that, but they're, they're darn good at what they do. Um, you know, it, at the end of the day, you you spend more time in areas that are less to do with the day-to-day -day operations. What you end up doing is really plotting and, and planning with your senior management team and the board the broad, long-range strategy of the corporation. That's where you spend your, what I would call the more day-to-day -day thinking. Sir. Let's go back to your interface with President Obama. Since you're a major player in terms of our energy providing environment, if you could make a suggestion or a number of suggestions, what would be your top three components for our now non existent national energy policy? <laughs> um, that's a tough question. Is what would be the, th if, if you could, you know, if you had 10 minutes with the president, what would be the three major components of uh, an energy policy? Uh, I would tie it to the economy, but I think to get our economy moving that we could do three or four things um, and base the economic growth on the availability of our natural resources and really producing and moving forward with our natural resources as the foundation of growing our manufacturing base, reestablishing our middle class and really building up a, a growing economy. And that's what this country needs. That's how we deal with the deficit. That's how we deal with, you know, the really the uh, Social Security shortfall that unfortunately you will encounter um, to, under current map. And how do we do it? I mean, we have to be able to produce our natural resources. If they're in the middle of a national park, no. But if they're in areas that or have produced natural resources in the past to get the permitting up and running. Uh, we've got to do it environmentally responsible, but we've got enough regulations and enough enforcement out there. It can be done, and we know at Arch we do it. Um, if we want to free up the, the creative spirits of, of American enterprise and American people is just stop with the regulations. I mean, don't roll lean back. I'm fine with that. Just stop piling more and more and more on until we digest. Because the business, the great thing about business in the, in the capitalistic society, it will adjust. 
but it needs time to adjust. And we've had so many things thrust upon us that that's why things are being choked off and why people aren't hiring. But for energy policy, it's use our own indigenous natural resources. We're blessed with you know, the greatest resource of coal in the entire world. We can use it. We can burn it cleanly. We need to put research money into burning it even cleaner. We can make chemicals out of China's making chemicals out of their coal plants. We can make petroleum products. Instead of sending our blood and treasure, literally, to a lot of countries around the world that don't particularly like us, let's start having a philosophy that, at least for a, you know, some of our needs, will convert coal to gasoline or to diesel fuel or to chemicals. Let's invest in research and further development on world-scale demonstration plants of carbon capture and sequestration. It can be done. It takes a will to do it. If we need to, you know, allow some of the, the natural resource development money coming off of that to help fund that. But it's really just taking what we've got and using it. Yes? The, the question was really what we call a tagger mine um, in Taylor County. When uh, when would it be opening? I think would be the and we would start hiring. You'll start seeing a slow but steady hiring starting almost right now. Um, again, the development of the mine. I mean, there, there's just a practical side. You have to um, build it. But I think you will start seeing the hiring probably step up in a significant way in 2012 and then in a really large way in 2013. Um, our objective, frankly, is to advance that coal mine to get it developed sooner. Uh, it's a wonderful quality coal for steel making. It's in great demand around the world and, you know, it will create. For every job, we found it at our mines here in West Virginia, for every direct job that the mine uh, creates. So roughly when you look at overtime pay and the average pay and then benefits of roughly $100,000 a year job. There's usually five to eight indirect jobs that support the mine. So those will be warehouse people, uh, you know, and anybody from uh, somebody running a convenience store that the miners use to, you know, folks that are supplying equipment to us. But uh, it'll have an economic impact and, and positive economic impact. But with any type of growth, there's a negative side to growth too, and you never have to ignore that. Uh, um, but you know, nonetheless, that hiring should occur. We, you know, right now down in the southern part of the state, we're hiring qualified miners right now. I mean, we're more than happy, particularly if you've got a skill set of, in the hourly ranks of electrician or welder. Or, frankly thinks that I'm incapable of doing, but uh, um, the needs are, are, are going to be there and they're going to be greater. So I would say in the next uh, four to five months, you'll see a little step up in hiring. The next 18 months, a big step up in hiring. Yes? From a national point of view, um, I think the, uh, I'm sorry, the question was how, do, how does the coal industry see the development of Marcellus Shale? Um, from a national point of view, I mean, the, the type for sands production and fracking is, is an amazing technology that has really freed up a, and will free up an enormous amount of gas, natural gas, that the world's going to need, that the U.S. is going to need. The negative side, and just like coal mines have a negative side, I mean, they use six million gallons of water or four million gallons of water per well, handling the water. Um, obviously, when the shale underlies cities and towns, I mean, you have to, you have, comes back to my opening comments, you've got to deal with the communities here and, and be a responsible citizen in the communities. We saw it out in Wyoming where the coal bed methane gas producers frankly just kind of came in, drilled wells, and they 
did things with the water that, as a coal company, we literally would go to jail for. And I think the natural gas industry is learning that process. They still have a ways to go. Uh, frankly, they could learn from the, the coal industry. As a competitive fuel source for producing electricity, um, you know, it goes back to that chart. Uh, even at $4 natural gas, if they can make a return, they're still not that low a cost compared to some of the other fuels. But, um, you know, ultimately, um, I think you'll see Marcellus become a huge national resource. The key, I think, for the men and women and, and citizens of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, is to make sure that it's a responsible development. And, and that, it's, that's not saying no development. Um, you know, I don't see gas as a bad thing. I don't see it as a good thing. thing. I see it as, as a natural resource. It is a competitor of coal. You know, we don't have run nasty ads like some of the ANGA guys do uh, um, or the Natural Gas Association against coal, but frankly, we could. But again, there's been voices like mine and others in the coal side of the business that just says, that's not who we are. And we're not going to get in a mud throwing contest here. Uh, ultimately, we'll stand on our own merits and, you know, the markets will decide and the communities will decide on what's the appropriate source. But it's a wonderful natural resource. And frankly, the world's going to need it. it. You go back to that global scale stuff, and as an energy producer, just to see you know, the coal plants that are being built right now, which will demand another roughly 800 million tons of coal, you start saying, how do we do that in the next five years? I mean, that's I mean, one of coal's big negatives. It's heavy, it's hard to mine, it's hard to transport. So. Um, I do see more coal going overseas, but it's the demand in the market. The question was, do you, do you see more coal going overseas and, and, you know, the demand for electricity here in the United States, the, the fundamentals have changed a bit uh, and that manufacturing and industry has gone down. And really, if you go back and go back to, say, 2008 before the 2009 recession, Demand was growing in all three sectors. It was commercial, re and, you know, the way the utilities kind of look at it is commercial, residential, and commercial office buildings or schools, that sort of thing, and then manufacturing. Most of the manufacturing, the heavy manufacturing of the United States tends to be in coal-fired states. So when manufacturing goes down, coal does get disproportionately impacted simply because it's typically the lowest cost electricity and, and manufacturing put its plants there because of that in, in many respects. So we need that manufacturing base to recover, and it has not recovered to 2008 levels. Maybe it never will, so if, under that premise, you might see a decline. Uh, but when you look at residential or commercial use, it went flat, slightly down in 2009, and then started climbing again. And, and we, we are not as energy intense as we used to be. But we still, as we add people and build houses and expand our GDP, instead of growing at you know, like 0.85 for every point of GDP, we add 0.85 of energy demand, it's like 0.75. But you still, and it makes logical sense, you have more people, you use more energy. In the back, yes. Uh, if I heard the question correctly, uh, in case of global disruption and uh, supply of energy, how could coal be used to, to meet some of the needs? And it would take, you know, time to, to make the, the liquid products, but, um, you know, we're blessed that we would be able to keep our engine of our economy in terms of electricity running um, because most of our uh, coal is domestically supplied to the U.S. power plants. I mean, when we talk about the U.S. producing about 1.1 billion tons a year of coal, roughly 100 million goes into steel making, and roughly 100 million is going to be exported this year. 
and the rest is used domestically to produce electricity for the most part. And you know, we have the technologies, and the technologies exist elsewhere. As I said, China's making fuels out of coal. South Africa's been making fuel, uh, petroleum products out of coal for 50 years. Um, other countries have demonstration projects of it. So, but we'd have to build the plants, and that would obviously take you know, four or five years if you could get the permits. Uh, so the ability to do it exists. The question is, do you have the needs? And right now, the marketplace would say, well, maybe we don't. But if there were a major Middle Eastern supply disruption, that, that thinking would change, I'm sure. But we do have the resources to do it. <coughs> yes, all the way in the back. The, the question was, the 800-pound gorilla in the room is mountaintop removal, and I think, what is Arch's perspective? Um, well, there's one side of it is, is, I mean, we have some, some large area surface mines, uh, not many here in West Virginia, but we do have a couple. And our perspective is that the reserves themselves actually drive you away from those large um, mountaintop removal mines over the next decade. So even if the permitting and the 404 question, 404 permits or water permits, suddenly resolve themselves, which they won't, uh, the reserves themselves dictate that that type of mining will diminish. Um, may not totally disappear, but it would diminish dramatically. And in fact, already has. If you look at mining in West Virginia, and part of it's driven by the permitting regulations, uh, but most of it's driven by the underlying reserve base. Uh, I know for Central App, I don't know West Virginia's numbers exactly, but for Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, uh, Southern West Virginia, our maximum production was in 2000 and, or 1998, and it was 287 million tons, somewhere in that vicinity. Last year, uh, our total production was 185 million tons. Our projections are that that will continue to decline, and it's driven by the fundamental reserve base, um, and will go down to the 160 or 150 level over the next five or six years. Um, and the mines that are being developed are principally underground mines. So I can take you to mountaintop mines that were mined 30 years ago, and you can't tell where we mined. I can take you to mines that were mined yesterday, and it's real easy to tell where you mine. So, um, but I think it, it's pretty clear that the, the regulatory environment is slowly choking those mines off. And if that doesn't happen, the um, reserves themselves will do it over the next 10 years. So, any other questions? Well, you know the answer to that. <laughs> the question was originally was trained as an engineer in engineering school, and is that a good background for business? How does it affect business philosophy, and uh, is it a good good path in business? Um, bias, yes, I, I, I think it is. Um, you know, the, the great thing about engineering is it teaches you to try to look at problems and, and try to solve problems, and it kind of gives you a method of thinking about problems. So. You know, you, you look at, you know, going back to the mountaintop question, you look at, well, can we do other things? Can we do something so the water is less effective? And in fact, Arch is doing a lot of that. Um, we uh, are using a bioreactor to remove selenium from water, which, you know, you look at it and it doesn't look too sophisticated, but it's actually, you know, a lot of biology that we are removing selenium from low concentrations and low flows at, at a couple of our mine sites. Um, but it, it really teaches you to focus on solving the problem. The challenge with CO2 is that. I mean, you never get the question. The great question, when, next time you're in an environmental discussion, 
How much CO2 is man-made every year that's emitted to the atmosphere? Does anybody know? Is it 50% of the total emissions over a course of a year? Is it 10%? 80%? As an engineer, that's really the first question you ask. If you're trying to fix a stream of something or you know, remove selenium from water or you know, remove dissolved sol solids from water, the first question you ask is, really the first couple questions, is how much water is flowing and how much 